Lisa. Everybody. We're here to talk about India with two extremely smart women. India is the largest democracy in the world and an emerging economic superpower. But in some critical way, the promise of India is unfulfilled, especially for women who feel caught between the energy of modernity and the dire gender inequities that bedevil their progress. Barker Dutt, you've already seen at this summit and you've seen her before, but I could not resist bringing her back because I always love to hear from her one of India's leading TV journalists, and she's just written a fascinating book that's also a memoir. It's called The Unquiet Land, and it takes a look at these paradoxes that we're going to discuss today. And Menika Guraswamy is an esteemed attorney who practices law in India's Supreme Court. She's also served as human rights consultant to the UN and is currently visiting at Yale Law School. So I'd like to start with a question for both of you, because it is a fascinating conundrum. Four of the chief ministers in India are women, they wield tremendous power. Women are leading banks, including the State Bank of India. Women, including you both, of course, have powerful voices in the media, in the realm of law, and so on, that refuse to be silenced. And yet there are such deep inequities in India when it comes to rape, domestic violence, sexual harassment, caste. I'd like to ask each of you how you explain this paradox. I'm going to start with you, Barker. Well, Tina, um, it's great to be here, first of all, and it's much nicer to be on this side of the divide uh, <laughs> than that side. It makes my life a bit easier. Um, we're a contradictory culture. India has a paradox in many ways, and what's happening with women captures that paradox. I often get into arguments here with my American friends because I don't get the fuss over, you know, why you haven't had a woman president yet. And we had one, in the, we had a woman leading us in the 70s. I have arguments on abortion. Why is this an issue? Why does a woman not have a right over her own body? So in some ways, it's interesting because people I meet here expect me to be the sort of, you know, diminutive, slightly retiring, kind of shy, oppressed personality. And I sometimes find the women I meet here much more conditioned by conservatism. That said, I can't lie, there are deep entrenched inequities in India. And that is the contradiction of our culture. Menika and I represent women of privilege. We cannot claim to be sitting on this stage and representing the millions of women sure. who do not have freedom. And people always ask me, what is feminism? And I say feminism is about freedom, and millions of Indian women do not have freedom. And the biggest irony is that though we see women in the headlines everywhere, in political positions, leading banks, leading hedge funds, leading TV channels, we do not even have a law on marital rape, and it's gone twice to parliament, and parties that are headed by women have sent it back as if to suggest that marriage is a license to rape. So we are in this conundrum. There's an inflection point, things are changing, gender's finally mainstream, it's not on the margins. We're voluble, we get heard, we're opinionated, but there are, we are exceptions, and India is caught in the middle of that contradiction. Manika, is that how you see it? Well, firstly, Tina, I, I love being on a panel of, of only short-haired women. It's not <laughs> something that ever happens to me, I'm just saying. Um, look, we are a country of 1.2 billion and counting. Uh, we are of deep inequality, yet we are a committed constitutional democracy. Uh, we are an argumentative, dissent-oriented, um, deeply diverse country deeply diverse people. That's what makes India so interesting. So are there contradictions in the extraordinary um, representation of, of women in positions of power, but yet positions of many women who don't have any power? Absolutely. Um, but we are also a country where 
an extraordinary proportion of our population is below the age of 30. And it is in these women, these men and women of diverse faith, of diverse genders, um, of diverse aspirations, um, it is in this young India that, we, that, that gives us cause for optimism. Well, Barker, in your book, you tell a very moving story of a woman called Banwari Devi, who was mm -hmm. the anti-child marriage activist who opened your eyes, you say, in 1992 to a very different India from the one that you'd thought about when mm -hmm. you were a feminist student mm -hmm. in Delhi. Why was Benwara Devi such an important sort of pivot woman in your life? So it's interesting, Tina. Um, like so many women here in this hall, uh, my feminism was shaped by Gloria Steinem and Germain mm -hmm. Greer and mostly actually borrowed from the West. And it actually missed the intersectionality of gender, class, caste, what race is here, caste is in India. And then I become a journalist and I go armed with all these very simple-minded notions of what feminism means. And the first story I've sent out to report, I'm a 20-something reporter, and I go out to report on this village in, in Rajasthan uh, where there is this woman born into a, a lower caste, what we call Dalits, and she is gang-raped by five men for stopping the marriage of a one-year-old girl, a one-year-old girl. And you know what? One of the five men who rape her is the father of that girl. Wow. And for 23 years, this woman has been fighting for justice and has not got it. A judge in the court said that men belonging to a higher caste would not possibly want to touch a woman of her caste, so the rape could not be true. And you know what's extraordinary about her? We are a country that is finally covered all of us sitting here, Menaka and me, by sexual harassment guidelines. And Bhavari Devi's fight went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the judges finally gave us protection at the workplace, thanks to this one uneducated woman, gang raped, still awaiting justice in her case, and a one-year-old baby girl. Yeah. And the rapist is that girl's father. It's unbelievable. You know, it's so interesting, as you were talking, I was thinking how Benoit Davi like Anita Hill, she's this woman who kind of ends up coming forward and be refusing to be silenced, and then she has this hell that follows mm. the sacrifice, in a sense, of coming forward. Why hasn't she got justice? Well, I think it's shameful. I think it's revelatory about um, the lower court system in India. Um, much needs to be done. We have not committed to reforming the court system. We don't invest enough in infrastructure, in, in judges, in appointment of judges. Um, it's a deeply uneven system where, a, where the average citizen's first experience of the state is either a police officer or a trial court. Um, and in these spaces, you know, the Constitution must shine through in terms of access to justice uh, and an ability be, to be treated equally. We have to invest more. But having said all of that, and having, and I agree with Barca, there is much that needs to be done. I think we also live in a country today where there is much more awareness of sexual assault. Extraordinary women put under extraordinary circumstances. Mm. Survivors of assault speak out. Yeah. And they, they speak unequivocally. They say that we are not ashamed. It is those who perpetrate these acts that should be ashamed. And that is the real revolution in India. That's new. That is definitely new. Well, Barker, in 2012, there was another huge national pivotal mm -hmm. moment. The breathtaking brutality of the gang rape of the woman in Delhi, who became known in Naba as Nabaya in the headlines. Yet the response from India's female politicians was so disappointing. Why were they so reticent and cowardly? Just briefly, for those of you who may not be familiar with the case, uh, Nirbhaya uh, in Hindi means fearless, one without fear. And it came to be the, uh, the name used for this young 23-year-old girl who was studying to be a doctor, and her father had sold everything he had to give his daughter an education. She was coming home from a movie. She'd gone to see The Life of Pi. She hopped onto this bus with a friend. She was gang-raped in the most brutal, horrific way. There was an iron rod that was inserted in her private parts, an iron rod, and then she was thrown off the bus and left there to, to basically die. She died a few days later. Now, this is horrific, yes, but I think 
we must also say it was an inflection point and something shifted. Something shifted in the conversation. There were young men and women marching on the streets. We had a new rape law, a much tougher law for, 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 you know, uh, that punishes and penalizes uh, rapists after this. But to answer your question, I discovered to my horror that if we thought more women in politics necessarily means a less misogynistic political system, Tina, that did not happen. And I don't know if in some ways you deal with those questions here, where a number of Americans I meet say, hang on, just because you know, Hillary Clinton's a woman doesn't mean that we're going to have a more feminist administration. Just because Barack Obama is a person of color doesn't mean that Ferguson doesn't happen. And we're grappling with those contradictions. It's so disappointing. I mean, Sonia Gandhi, who is, you know, the head of the Congress party, she was just silent for several days when all of this was happening. As was the chief minister of Delhi where this happened, who's also a woman. Yeah. And, 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 and it speaks to my dilemma. Uh, you know, are we, are we pursuing the wrong lead here? You know, we just automatically assume that numerically having more women will make it a more sensitive system. But women are as conditioned by the culture of misogyny as men are, A, all of us are. Why should I exempt myself from that? We're all, we're all conditioned by, you know, our varying influences of misogyny. And B, women in politics feel the pressure because they're deconstructed in ways that men aren't to be much more like men than even the men. Mm. And this is something that really is a deep, long-term fight. Well, Monica, the number of rapes has gone up, not down, since the nearby case, which might be due perhaps to more women coming forward. That's right. But what's troubling is that the conviction rate for rape cases has barely moved. It's up to just 28% from 24% in 2012. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that, that what we looked at, though, those crowds in the street, which are men and women, which was mm -hmm. very, very encouraging, mm -hmm. It was sort of a gender Arab Spring, we all thought. Mm. Why not more movement in the courts? So I think there, there, there are three things about this question, right, um, uh, Tina. One, conviction statistics um, pertaining to any crime um, doesn't tell you much. All over the world, Britain, America, India, so on and so forth, conviction rates for traditional crime, murder, rape, theft, is very low. It is, this is the reality of all court systems, where all kinds of things make a difference, the quality of lawyer, the quality of judge, the quality of your case, protection of evidence, so on and so forth, and I can go on for a long time. I think we must judge our court system on the basis of one, how long does it take to arrive at a conclusion, two, do we ensure that the survivor is not you know, victimized again through the process, and three, are we able to ensure integrity of the process? And I think to that extent, much needs to be done, and a lot needs, and, and a lot has been undone. Well, Barker, since the enormous attention of that Nabaya case, do, do women feel less safe in India, actually, in Delhi? Do women not feel safe, or you think that they have gone, you know, forgotten it at this point? No, I think there is a sense that we are vulnerable, and I think uh, that's, that never leaves you. Uh, I think what's shifted is not an increased sense of safety, uh, but the awareness that if this happened to you, you could speak today yes. with the hope that more people would support you than had you spoken 15 years ago. Right. Perhaps it's not as isolating as it was, though it's still pretty damned lonely, but less so than it used to be to speak up about abuse, sexual violence, assault. Well, you know, speaking of that, of course, in your book, you tell the very troubling story of how you were sexually molested by a relative before you even turned 10, and you allege that rape and molestation inside Indian families is a major issue. Why did you share your own personal experience now, and is it changing, and what has been the reaction? It was a really difficult decision uh, for me to decide whether I should put my experience of child sexual abuse and later um, with sexual violence uh, in an adult relationship as well in this book. Um, it was a difficult decision for two reasons, Tina. One, I was writing a book on India, and I it was not an, strictly an autobiography. I did not want to be the story. I wanted to tell the story. The second reason it was difficult, because as anybody in this hall knows, when something like this happens, and when you're a child, I was younger than 10 years old, you bury it. You bury it and you try and forget it, and then something happens, a smell, a sound, and it reminds you, and then you push it out again. And then when you have to write about it, you have to excavate it from somewhere deep within you, and you relive it. 
and, and, and it feels like yesterday. And even sitting here today, I'm 44 years old, but I feel like I'm eight years old again. You know, I, I can see that man's face in my, in, in, in my head every time I talk about it. Why did I talk about it? Because I cannot, with any honesty, write about feminism, call myself a feminist, talk about the need to lift the veil of silence and the conspiracy of silence around sexual violence and abuse if I'm not ready to break the silence in my own life. That was the reason. And when later on as a student, you were roughed up by this uh, man that you were dating, quite nastily beaten up, again, you didn't come forward then. Was that about the period of feeling that you would be tarred? And do you regret that you didn't? I did try and, um, I did try and come forward because I had told myself that I'm not going to be silent. I'm not going to be silent. I can understand my silence as a child, but less so as an adult. But when I went to the faculty where I was studying, and I actually went and consulted lawyers, and I said, I want to take this man to court. You know, he hit me. I went home with bruises across my face, and when my father and my sister asked me what happened, I said I walked into a door. Mm -hmm. I, with all my awareness, still felt that sense of shame. I felt like the embarrassment was mine, and I wanted to fight that feeling. So I went to meet these lawyers, and the lawyers told me, you're going to waste your time. You're going to be in court for the next 25 years. Nobody's going to believe you. You were dating this guy. They're not going to even you know, punish him. Just forget about it. And he was in the same profession as me. When I signed up to be a journalist at, at my network, I just had one request of my employers. I said, if you hire this guy, I will not work here. And they backed me on that. But I do regret it today. I, I, I feel I should not have heard those, listened to those lawyers. I feel I should not have been defeatist. And I feel I should have gone to court. Because so what if it takes 20 years? It's important. Mm. Wow. <laughs> Easier said than done. OK, well, as we're heading for the close here, in this summit, we've talked a lot about misogyny, mm. misogyny that's currently in the United States, misogyny as manifested in many cultures. Menika, do you think there is endemic misogyny in Indian culture? I think, look, there's endemic misogyny in all cultures. We sit here in the time of Donald Trump. Mm. It's extraordinary. <laughs> it's funny how that you name know? keeps coming up. Yeah, but, but you know, he's emblematic today yeah. of misogyny. He's emblematic today of the fact that in political spaces and through democratic politics, you will also have horrific uh, phenomenon like the, the phenomenon that is Donald Trump. Um, I don't want to, I, I, I think it would be deeply unnuanced to characterize a culture um, as being, you know, pervasively um, misogynistic. I think we all live in a world that is deeply patriarchal. My feminism is shaped uh, by the founders of India's, India as a constitutional uh, republic uh, that is located in equality and dignity and addressing traditional disadvantage. I think those are values that should resonate in this room, in this country, across cultures. Um, so to all politicians, um, that Trump uh, symbolizes a cross in my country, in mm. your country, in your country. I say that the men and women who vote must send a message. And I say in all our countries, take your country back. Mm -hmm. Take your country back. Um, Barker, closing words. My closing words are only this, that when I come to a conference like this, Tina, and you do a wonderful job of getting so many varied voices together, what you do realize is how much more we have in common yeah. than how much we have apart. You listen to what indigenous women in Canada go through. You listen to us in India. You, you, know, you just heard the Anita Hill case. This is gender is a global conversation. Yeah. It manifests itself in different ways. Prejudices manifest themselves in different ways, but I think there's, there's an energy out there. There's an energy out there. I think, I think this is the age of, of women, and I think I'm, we're all part of it together, and I feel this bonding in this room. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> Fabulous.